Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot known locally as the February Room is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Uh, my guest today is one of those people that you go fishing with and immediately realize that you're on a similar wavelength, that uh, you enjoy this sport for the same reasons as they do. She is a lifelong angler and a very busy professional woman, on, and, woman and I'm looking forward to catching up with her. Uh, Marie Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's so nice to be here and thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate uh, you taking the time. We know that uh, you've got a, uh, uh, a busy business and a, and a little kiddo and a lot of stuff going on. So uh, <laughs> thanks again. And uh, yeah, um, I, you know, I know you're a very avid freshwater and saltwater angler and um, have had uh, a lot of experience in your days. So do you have a, uh, a recall that comes to mind that you could share with us? Yeah, so I actually started fishing when I was about six years old. Um, my dad, uh, he was an anesthesiologist, and like all anesthesiologists, he played golf and fished. Um, that seems to be where you can find all the doctors in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, um, <laughs> either on the golf course or out on the streams. Um, and coming from a you know first generation um, South Korean family. It was interesting because culturally, obviously, in Asian families that, uh, you know, everything is surrounded around the sun. Um, and my poor dad had two girls. So uh, <laughs> he ended up in a situation where he had to figure out which kid was going to act like the sun. So I, I, I gladly took that role. Um, but, you know, I actually started fishing when I was really young. Um, my dad had a, a weird work schedule because, you know, back in those days, they would allow, you know, physicians to stay on for, you know, 48 hour shifts and things like that. So um, and then he would have the next, you know, couple of days off. So I remember um, I used to go to a Catholic school when my dad would pick me up or we get home and my dad would have, you know, my my bag packed and my mom would take care of my sister. My dad and I would kind of head out to the lakes or the tributaries um, off of Lake Erie. I grew up in a, in a small rural town in Western Pennsylvania. And so, um, yeah, I started fishing with my dad when I was uh, super young. Um, and it was pretty cool. Um, especially being number one, I think, a, a girl, um, and also number two in that seeing how much my dad really, really, you know, in a high stress, um, environment from a workplace perspective and professional life that he found such comfort and solace in the water. Um, and that's something definitely that has just, you know, resounded with me um, over the years. Um, one of the things I actually remember about my dad was one of the first times we went fishing, he took me over to a uh, uh, Twin Lakes in Greensburg. Um, and uh, we had been sitting there for probably a couple of hours and, and nothing, nothing would bite. Um, and, uh, he had, you know, a line out with two hooks on them and he had to actually go use the restroom. And this is back in the day, you know, back in the eighties when you could actually leave kids alone for a little bit. So he went to go use the restroom right up the hill. Um, and he said, hold the rod. And he said, if it moves, just, you know, pull it up. So, you know, I'm six and all of a sudden I see the rod move and I set the hook as if it were like a tarpon, you know, on the other end of the line. And at that point I'm being like dragged into the water at six and I have no idea. I'm standing there like, oh my God, this is crazy. Um, and uh, a guy, you know, probably about 500 feet away sees that I'm getting pulled into the water and comes running over to help me. And uh, my dad comes back and, and he's kind of all, you know, kind of lazy fair and casual and, and everything. And, and as we're fighting the fish and getting everything uh, back together onto shore, um, we see that there are two fish on the end of the line. 
So it was pretty cool <laughs> that like my first experience with my dad you started off started off with a double. Huh? Oh, it was a, it was killer. And I think what was the coolest thing was uh, actually seeing my dad. Uh, well, the, the, the guy who helped out actually said he's like she's a hell of a fisherman, you know. <laughs> and my dad, that face, you know, it was like the light bulb went off. He's like. This is the moment where she becomes the sun. So um, <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's really it's it's really great just because you know we just we shared not just the love of of fishing on and, and not just fly fishing but um, conventional gear too, right? Fresh water, salt water, um, all of it is that you know it, it was that place. It's that place for us where it not only brought the peace and the comfort, uh, but also it provided us the opportunity to actually see so much of the world. Um, you know, even whenever, you know, I got older, um, I would take the week of July 9th off, which is his birthday, and we would, uh, you know, we'd pick a new place to go fishing every year. Um, and so uh, it's just, it's been you know, a hell of experience, um, you know, doing something like this, um, loving it so much, you know, and getting it to share, getting to share it, it with really like you know your best friend your mentor your buddy your dad you know the whole nine yards um unfortunately my dad um passed away kind of unexpectedly last october um and um you know i can say that it, you know it's been a year and and there is kind of that gaping hole that's there um you know missing my fishing buddy missing my dad um but it's interesting is that every time that i am on the water it's such a great remembrance um that you know he's provided me with that uh yeah it, it's wonderful yeah that's it, it's crazy my dad's birthday is july 9th as well oh wow yeah how about that and he he passed away in 2020 um i'm actually um as soon as we're done with this recording i am taking my kids and driving out to eastern oregon and i'm gonna go build a uh um, a, a rock cairn in his in his memory out where we uh where we all kind of together um, so yeah, anyway, not to, not to sidetrack, but, uh, I can totally relate. Um, that's, uh, that's who I fished with growing up and who introduced me to the sport. And, you know, those are my most cherished memories are fishing and hunting with my dad. It really is. You know, I think one of the things for me that actually makes such a significant difference is that, you know, in life, life is so stressful, you know, <laughs> as it is, you know, and, and I think COVID has definitely, um, been a factor in that too. But I'll tell you that, you know, my professional life is um, I own a biopharmaceutical consulting company and I've been doing this for 25 years and it, it, it's 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 stressful, you know, and it's a lot of hours. It's a lot of um, uh, brain stress um, and, you know, to be able to give your child something, you know, a self-soothing tool um, where, you know, it can certainly be shared with friends and loved ones and you know, a, a great day out in the water with your, your friends or your buddies, but also something that's also like really self-soothing, right? Um, where right. even if you're alone, that you learn to self-soothe then you learn to um, reflect and, and not have to have the stimuli of external people to make you feel better, but really kind of come into oneness with yourself. Um, it's, it's like the greatest gift, you know, I'm going to be 48 um, in January and um, I actually have a four-year-old um, and so that's one of the things that I think about is that, you know, what are the, what are the things that I can give to him, right. Um, that will help him in his adult life and, you know, through mid, you know, midlife through, you know, growing old as a person. I think one of the most important things, honestly, is teaching someone number one independence, but also number two is that, um, you know, to really learn to, um, be self-reliant in an emotional, mental, and spiritual way as well. So um, I definitely, definitely, yeah, learned that from my dad. And, and I, I like totally, it's, it's funny. I, you know, uh, you know, being a, a girl in the sport um, and, you know, for me, it's that, you know, it was, it's always kind of like raises eyebrows a little bit, uh, maybe not so much in freshwater, certainly in saltwater it does. You know? <laughs> um, but, you know, it, I just encourage all the dads out there who have little girls, even if you do have a son, you know, <laughs> unlike my dad. Um, but even if you do have a son, it's like, take your girl fishing, you know? And I think more than anything, um, it's not just the stillness and, and what you get afterwards, but man, the experiences my dad and I had together traveling and the relationship that we had because of that 
um, the love for being outdoors, the love for the environment, the love of conservation, the love of, of, of fishing together and spending time together. Um, it's just something that really does. It lasts a lifetime and beyond. Yeah, our, our four-year-old daughter is just obsessed with fishing. Um, we took her up to the family cabin in Wisconsin this summer. And I mean, it was nonstop. Like if I was around, she's like, dad, let's go. She'd grab her pole, go out to the end of the dock. Oh, so and uh, you know, of course the, the kids next door were, they were catching fish on worms. So I had to sit there and, you know, cut up the earthworms, which uh -huh. is a pain in the ass. <laughs> and, <yeah. laughs> and then, you know, the poor bluegill take them too deep half the time, but but it was every cast and uh, she was just, she was just going nuts for it. It was really cool to see. And so now she's like, uh, where's my, where's my rod uh -huh. in, in this, in this pile? Uh -huh. like, well, you know, so I made something up and I pulled out this one and you know, this one, she's like, she starts crying. She's like, no, 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 that is not mine. I, <laughs> well, you know like, what, Justin, I think by next year, you know, for next season is that you buy her, her own little pocket knife and you know what I mean? And she'll be doing oh, yeah. up the gross earthworms on her own. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. You know, that's something that I picked up on right away. Um, fishing with you, I guess, geez, that's been two years now, I guess. But, um, and you know, one thing I picked up on with you in the boat um, right out of the gate was like, wow, you know, this, this angler is here to relax, right? Like this is not, uh, an ego thing. This is not a competitive thing. Um, sure. The nice fish were up eating grasshoppers and, you know, we, we, we got a couple, we hooked a couple and then, um, you know, you just kind of took a minute to, to pull over and, and soak it all in and just relax and look around. And, and um, that's not something that, that everybody does. It's funny to me every time, you know, that uh, there's, there's, some professional in the boat who says that they're out there to relax, but clearly they're not relaxing. Right. <laughs> and for, for you, I could just, you know, I picked up on it that fishing is really meditative for you. It totally is. You know, um, unless you talk to my saltwater guide and he'll tell you absolutely not. <laughs> right. Actually, right. I'll talk about the difference between fresh and salt. It is like a Sure. You sure. Know, sure. Here's the thing I think with me is that, you know, is that again, like my professional life and my home life is extremely busy. And so for me to get, you know, a day to sneak out of work and away from family and away from everyone, you know, and be able to fish alone, um, even if it's a short weekend trip or even a day, you know, out in salt water here, since I live in the Keys, is, I mean, it really is a tremendous blessing and so much to be grateful for. And, and so I guess like whenever I fish, you know, I, there are days, trust me, where I, you know, have all of this energy and I'm like, you know, guns a blazing and, and I want to fish hard, hard, hard. Um, but I'm going to tell you that those days are probably few and far between because mostly is that I like to get out in the water, you know what I mean? And experience everything that's around me. I love listening to you all, you know, rowing that drift boat, you know, or the slight body movement where I think you're going to turn right versus left or, you know, and, and taking in just the beautiful surroundings that we have. I mean, in this kind of great country of ours, we have so many unbelievable landscapes. And as they say with trout fishing is it never takes you anywhere ugly. It's absolutely true. Um, so for me, it's like, I just want to shut everything off. You know, I'm, I always say, even though I own my company, it's like, I always say I'm sneaking out or I'm playing hooky from work. It's like, man, I love that. <laughs> you know, um, I'm running away from my boss. I'm running away from you know everything just to get out there and really understand and feel and and get recentered. You know, in terms of God's creation here, um, I'll say to be honest with you that for freshwater fishing for me is incredibly relaxing and incredibly um, just so therapeutic. And there are many days I really love to wade. So you know, there are many days when you know I used to love to go out and and wade and and sit on the bank for a while and and just watch and listen and, and all of that. Um, and then you compare that to saltwater fly fishing, which is a lot of hunting. Um, you're on the bow, on a platform, staring, hoping to see fish, pretending to see fish maybe even, you know, on those slow days, um, <laughs> you know, where every rock and grass looks like, you know, uh, a fish. Um, but 
it's totally different um, for me at least, you know, in, in salt water um, because it's incredibly intense. Um, I think by the day, day's end in saltwater fly fishing is that it really is like you're hunting and hunting and hunting for those limited shots that you get at tarpon, bonefish and permit and kudas. Um, but you know, it's much less predictable if you will. Um, but the thrill, you know, that thrill of, of the chase, the thrill of the, you know, couple seconds you can, you can possibly get in terms of, you know, throwing it out to a rolling tarpon and seeing if, if, if she's going to eat and, and watching that is just like so incredibly rewarding. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, fishing is fishing to me in terms of, you know, it is really about the experience and not the outcome. So some of my favorite days actually have been, and some of the days that I've learned the most um, have been days that have been quote fishless days. Um, but again, like for me, it's about the experience and not necessarily, you know, the outcome. Right. Right. So is there, so you don't necessarily have a preference between saltwater and freshwater fishing. It sounds like you kind of appreciate both of them for, for different reasons. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, I love it. I have to tell you, I didn't trout fish this year and I feel like my soul to some extent is empty. Um, it's just a place at least for, you know, freshwater fishing for me is, is totally meditative and, and relaxing and centering and, and beautiful. The only other experience I can equivocate that to on saltwater would be is just watching rolling tarpon, you know, um, and seeing these beautiful, you know, migratory fish um, in this like enchanted dance, you know, and it's coordinated and it's just so fluid. Um but again, when you're seeing those, you know, those rolling tarpon and, and when they're daisy chaining, it's that, you know, your guide's going to want you to cast. <laughs> right. So, uh, to some extent, it kind of ruins the meditation. But, you know, uh, at the end of the day is that it's 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 just they're both such magical experiences. You know, I've I, um, you know, I was lucky and, and honored enough to uh, fish the ladies tarpon fly tournament this year. Oh, cool. And, uh, you know, getting together with, you know, other women. Um, and it, it happens like right after, um, you know, a series of other um, major tarpon tournaments in Isla Morada and the poor guides, you know, they're back to back to back weeks, you know, booked up in terms of, you know, I think it's the golden fly, then the uh, uh, Don Holly, and then it's the uh, ladies tarpon fly. And then a week or two later is uh, the gold cup. So these poor guides, you know, God bless them. Um, they, absolutely you know deserve every ounce and more of of what they make um you know they're pulling us through you know wind rain the whole nine yards um because tournament days aren't you know aren't days that you know you can say okay i'm uh it's windy you know we're gonna go look for redfish um so you know one of the things that really was so wonderful you know for the ladies tarpon fly is that um the women are really collegial and everyone is extremely supportive of one another. Um, and that's just something. That oh, come on. I swear to God, it's the weirdest <laughs> thing. And actually, if you talk to the guys, uh, the, you know, all, all of the guides uh, that fish those tournaments, um, I don't know that there's a female guide that I've seen um, who, you know, is a guide in the tournament. Um, but, you know, they'll tell you that their favorite tournament, um, it, you know, to fish is actually the ladies. Um, of the four major tarpon tournaments, it's the ladies. And it's because it's a fun and collegial and competitive. It's quite competitive. Um, but in a, you know, fun, bantering, you know, kind of lift each other up, have fun together, um, you know, talk about how shitty or how wonderful the day was, <laughs> um, whatever it is. It, it's just, it's really, really cool. So aside from like the meditation part and the relaxing part and all of that, um, it's just, you know, really I think put me in touch with some really wonderful individuals, um, not just in, you know, not just other fellow women, but um, I also fished the Herman Lucerne, um, which was, you know, male and female and met some wonderful other um, seriously incredible competitors um, and, and, and men who, who do this year after year. And, you know, they may just be figments of imagination on social media, but to actually get to meet and fish alongside them is really an honor. Well, wow, that's really cool. That um, that um, tournament scene is in uh, sharp contrast to uh, to the picture painted in the book that I just read about. You know, 
the, the Tarpon book that Monty mm-hmm. Burke wrote about the, you know, the chase for the record and, and how aggro and the, I read that <laughs> book and I was like, well, God, I don't even want to go tarpon fishing in Florida now. Oh, and, no. uh, you know, I, I have done it before. It's been a while, but like, you know, that, that book just kind of painted a scene of why I don't like fishing right. and the things that I don't like about it. What, not just tarpon, other species as well, where, right. you know, I, I've, uh, it, it's been a really competitive kind of agro environment. Right. Like, well, this is the antithesis of why I like to, to right. fish. I'm out of here. I, I, you know what? And I, I'll say this, you know, at the end of the day is that, you know, it's what you make of it. Um, if, you know, definitely tournament fishing is obviously highly competitive. You don't want to compete unless you want to win. Right. Um, or you want to place. Um, the, the flip side of it is, is that like what I just described, um, is that both in the Herman Lucerne and then also, you know, the gold cup, excuse me, the uh, ladies is that you really get to meet some really badass people, you know, who, you know, will be colleagues and friends for the rest of your life. Um, and, and, you know, make plans to share a boat. Um, so for example, like in November, I, I, I met Betsy Bullard, who is like the grand dame of, you know, fly fishing for women. And she's just about the coolest, badass, you know, um, woman ever. Um, and so much fun. Um, and so we get to share a boat together just to fun fish together, um, in, you know, November 29th. Um, and then I've met some, you know, really killer guides and things like that. But I do, I certainly understand the whole agro mentality. And I will say that during tarpon season per se, um, sometimes that it can get like that, but, you know, when you're with a good guide, a seasoned guide, you know, if you don't want to sit along the beach and wait for tarpon, strings of tarpon to be rolling by, you know, and you happen to be fishing an island marauder or, or back that way is that you can always go back into the park. You, they're, they're, you know, here in Big Pine, you can always go in the back country. Um, we're lucky enough here in the Keys where I believe it's about 30% of our uh, tarpon are actually resident tarpon. So, you know, pretty much like during, um, if you've got warm days, even in the dead of winter, you can find tarpon. Um, but I think, you know, yeah, to, to your credit is that I get it, you know, in terms of the, uh, the visual that it, that it gives you, but I still think, I mean, you know, for me at least that, you know, it's kind of what you make of it. Um, and if you've got a good guide who you're in sync with, um, you know, you'll be able to still find that peace and that fun and the, um, really like the joy, you know, of saltwater fishing as well. Yeah. It's interesting to me that, um, there's not, um, more female guides, um, you know, around here, right off the top of my head, I can think of four, you know, really good female guides that we have in this community now, um, Mm -hmm. that I work with and that I see on the river all the time that are, you know, full-time professional guides, um, that are, that are booked solid. Right. Um, I wonder how much longer it'll be before th- there's a establishment of female guides down where you're at. No, I it's think only, that's... It's really only a matter of time. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, um, I don't. I actually don't know of any female saltwater guides. Um, I'm sure that there are some. Um, I've just not had the pleasure of meeting them or, or knowing about them. You know, I think that the thing is in the Keys, you know, listen, it's the PhD of fishing here, right, for saltwater fishing. You know, you can go and catch bonefish, um, you know, at various places of the world. You can go to Christmas Island, you can go to Belize, you can go to the Bahamas, and you can catch the shit out of bonefish. Uh, when you get to the Keys is that, you know, it, it is truly the PhD of, of saltwater fishing. Um, it is, they're smart fish, they're on the move, you know. Um, it's a trickier environment to fish. Um, and um, I think, you know, when you start, you know, people talk about even like tarpon fishing in, in Cuba and and tar- tarpon fishing, um, you know, in other places in the Caribbean, and and you can catch, you know, a zillion a zillion fish. That's not necessarily the environment here. Uh, it's much more. I think it's technical, and I think from what I understand from you know various guides and other anglers, it's it's it is more technical here. Our fish are uh, a little are, are more educated. Um, it's kind of like the bonefish of Hawaii, right? Um, they're giant and they're massive and they're amazing. Um, and they get to be, you know, double digits and you can see multiple double digits a day. Um, but there are those fish you're not going to catch, uh, you know, 30 of them, like, you, you know, uh, 30, you know, giant bonefish in Hawaii, like you are, um, in, in Belize. 
um, you know, where they're much smaller and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, you know, it's at the end of the day for me, again, it comes down to, Hey, I get to sneak out of work. I don't have to work that day. I'm going to get on someone's skiff and, um, you know, I get to go look for some fish and, you know, I'm, I'm just happy about that. Oh man. If I lived in Florida, my business would tank. <laughs> No doubt, <laughs> but I mean it's all relative, right? Like, yeah, exactly. You, you probably say the same thing about being here, but uh, we're both fortunate that we have so much opportunity right in our backyard. It's it's funny that what you know what you mentioned about um, about specifically bone fishing, and and it it goes for any fish. But so often I meet people. And the topic turns to bone fishing and, you know, they're like, well, it was just so easy. Bone fishing is just so easy. It's like, no, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. where were you? What did you see? What did you catch? Because, you know, to catch a double digit bone fish is one of the hardest things in fly fishing. Oh, yeah. I no agree. doubt. You I know, agree. <laughs> and I've never I've never caught one. I hooked one one time uh -huh. briefly uh -huh. um, and it's 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 just funny it's like um you know folks are like oh christmas island was so easy it's just it, i i got bored at christmas island right i'm right. like well if you got bored at christmas island you're doing it wrong right i could not agree you know and that's the thing is that you can catch a zillion fish but again if you're into numbers and all that you can catch a zillion fish you know um in different places of the world you know just because of the the sheer number you know of the fish that are there um but you're right it's like catching a real big one they don't like they say, they don't get to be big by being stupid. Um, right. You know, I, I, you know, I love fishing Oahu and Molokai um, in Hawaii. And my favorite um, guide out in uh, Oahu is Kenny Karras of Hawaii on the Fly. Um, uh -huh. He's on Instagram. He's I've fished with him. Gosh, I don't know how many years, um, but he's so wonderful. And and he uh, he he just he really knows the ins and outs of the fishery. But it's funny, I you know, you walk the flats with Kenny and he's all soft, and nice and quiet. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of like, okay, well, all right, we see the fish. He's like, okay, and he'll point over to the fish. And as soon as I go to point my rod, right, in the direction of where the fish is, and it may be sitting right underneath the mangrove, I mean, these fish blow up. I mean, by me, even the movement of pointing my rod, and we might be 80 feet away. I mean, I swear right. they've, these big fish feel that energy, you know, um, of someone stalking them. Um, so yeah, they're, they're not, they're not easy fish to catch. I mean, if you, if you're, if you're fishing for them in muds, you know, um, or, you know, when they're mudding, um, or in schools, they tend to be easier, but they're definitely not. I, I just, I love the bone fish. I think of all saltwater fish. I really love, um, I love bone fishing. I, I just, I love tarpon fishing. I love it in salt water. I would say those two species for myself um, would be the best. Now we're, I'm, I'm actually going, um, my significant other and I are going to uh, the Seychelles for the first time in February. Um, oh, awesome. My goal is uh, I, I've always wanted to uh, catch a um, um, trigger fish. Trigger um, fish, yeah. face trigger, uh, those chompers, you know, like just look utterly just kissable, although they probably rip her lip off. <laughs> um, but they're just so, so cute. Um, and, and obviously, <laughs> GT, like, I'd love to, you know, get a GT. Um, so hopefully one of those, you know, I, I'll get my hands on, on one of those out there. But I'm super, super pumped. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's, um, yeah, that's. That's a bucket list trip for for more anglers than any other destination. I think more people mention that than than anything. You know, it's it's uh, that's going to be an amazing adventure. Yeah, I have a friend um, who uh, he's a he's a really wonderful friend. He's actually a client of Brandon's, um, but he uh, he's been to the Seychelles a number of times. And in fact, he's he's out there right now in Providence uh fishing um but that was his thing and it, it, i think he he booked going to st brandon's this year but um unfortunately um because of covid and everything it didn't work out but um to see these pictures you know what i mean of it's it's, it's not just like a magazine picture right of someone you don't know you know holding this massive fish and, and seeing uh you know these indo-pacific permit that he's that he's holding actually he had just gone to oman and now he's on his way to provenance to fish um tough life huh 
Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's just, it's really, really neat. And so I'm really looking forward to um, just seeing live, you know, and experience um, the fishery there and um, seeing the different species, obviously, that we don't have here. So I'm pretty pumped. Right. Right. Do they have those, um, what are they called? The Napoleonic wrasse? I don't, I'm not sure. Have you seen those things? I think, I wonder if they have them over there. I've seen them and I've seen pictures of them from, from Christmas Island. I've never uh-huh. seen one. Um, I'm not sure but, about that, uh, but they do have these bump heads, parrotfish, these, the bump head, they are. Those are coolest cool. things I've ever yeah, seen. Yeah. They're psychedelic. Oh man. They are really, really neat. Um, so yeah, it's just going to be interesting just to see, I don't know, just take it all in, I guess, you know, um, yeah. Has that, have you caught GTs before? So I've thrown in it Hawaii one, or? um, I, I've thrown it one, um, and it was not successful, but it was hilarious. Actually, I was with, uh, uh, I was with my, uh, brother-in-law and we were in Hawaii and it happened to be that, that in fact, uh, Kenny was not available. His wife was having a baby. Um, he tried to fish me. I hope that she's not listening to this, but he tried to fish me and he's like, well, maybe I can get out of the hospital <laughs> you know, if she's, if she's having the baby and fish you for the day. I'm like, Kenny, don't, because then you'll never be allowed uh, to fish me again. Like, don't do it. Don't do it. Um, but anyway, he had actually that's dedication. Me up. Yeah. He had actually hooked me up with one of his colleagues, Jake, um, who is just equally as just great and awesome. But we were out fishing, um, on uh, the windward side of the island and I was with my brother-in-law. So Jake was pulling around and, and we see what we thought it looked like was a bonefish, right? The water was a little bit murky and uh, there was a storm that came through, you know, the night before. And my brother-in-law, this is probably his like third time. I had taken him up to Lee's Ferry to go trout fishing uh, maybe two or three times. So maybe this was his fourth time fly fishing. Uh, it was his first time definitely fly fishing salt. <clears throat> He hadn't gotten a bonefish yet. Um, and this was, I think it was day two. And um, he's kind of bummed. I'm like, dude, just be patient. You'll get one. You'll get one. And uh, so we see this, you know, this dark shape in the water. And so, you know, Jake says, hey, 30 feet, you know, uh, at 11 o'clock. And, and Scott throws it in and he's able to get it. And all of a sudden he gets tight. And he gets tight. And all of a sudden, you know, you see this thing go absolutely ballistic. I mean, I'm talking crazy we're like dude this this bonefish is on it's like stairway. <laughs> this is gonna be the bonefish you know what i mean of a lifetime <laughs> and uh he's pulling and this fish is fighting and it probably was a total it felt like hours but it probably was a total of i don't know five six seconds right and we get the fish up to the top and we look and jake and i are just like Oh my God. And Jake screams, it's an effing GT. <laughs> and Scott's fighting the fish. And all of a sudden the, the fish turns and takes off at 3000 miles an hour and it's gone. Yeah. And I'm just standing behind him. And I'm, I mean, I'm speechless, totally speechless. And Jake is just shaking up on the, you know, on the platform. We're like, Oh my God, dude, it was a GT. And Scott's kind of all proud and excited and, you know, he's just, you know, reeling up the line and, and comes to switch off with me. And he sits down and he says, what's a GT? <laughs> <laughs> it was well, so awesome. I mean, it was really that awesome. That is awesome. The coolest thing actually the... was that, you know, he was so busy fighting the fish that he didn't really get a chance to even see it. But um, I had actually, uh, you know, uh, taken my, my uh, niece and my nephew um, and my sister um, and my brother-in-law, you know, to Hawaii and and so we were, uh, we went to go do some submarine tour the next day. So we were out in this sub and, you know, a reef or what have you, or near a wreck. And you see these giant, giant fish going by, you know? And Scott says, oh, wow. He said, those fish are really cool. I'm like, yeah, that's a GT. That's what you had on the end of your line yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> have you, uh, have you watched that, that opening scene in Planet Earth 2? I haven't. Oh, you need to check that out. And to, to all the listeners out there, you need to go watch this as well. So I, I was told it was filmed in the Seychelles. I don't know uh-huh. if that's a fact or not, but you need to go check that out. The, the GTs are eating eating seabirds off the surface. Yes, that's I, I've seen video of that. That's wild. Yeah, it is insane. Yeah, that puts into perspective um, 
just how voracious those predators are. And they are, they are beastly fish. I'm fortunate that I got to catch some in Christmas Island. I got to catch one in particular that just, just a <laughs> one, one that you'll never forget, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Maria, I, I know that you're on Instagram. What's your Instagram handle? You post some cool stuff. You're always in the Bahamas making me jealous, especially on these cold February days that are coming up. But uh, yeah, how can folks follow you and, uh, and sure. keep up with your fishing adventures? It's uh, Miri Loves Fishing Lee. So it's M-I-R-E-E -E, Loves Fishing Lee. Awesome. And then um, thank you so much for the W sauce, by the way. Let's give those guys a plug. Let's give those guys a shout out here. Yeah, that's it's just some amazing stuff. I mean, Bear Holman and Burton really got it right. For anyone who is uh, a, a cook or if you're a hunter, it really is amazing. I've been putting that in everything and everything. It's crazy. <laughs> Literally, I was making my elk stew when uh, the mailman showed up and <laughs> yep. and it was awesome. I, I dumped it right in there and uh, I've been using it. I've got it upstairs. I've got a big pot of... Uh, of elk spaghetti going right now mm -hmm. that I'm going to take to the cabin to share with my sisters and my nieces and nephew. And uh, it's 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 simmering with W sauce in it. It is the best stuff. So you got to check it out, folks. The W sauce. <laughs> Go to thefebruaryroom.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories, and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the February room .com. The February room is always free, but if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February room, and we'll see you down here next week. <laughs>